the year 1850, down to which I have now arrived, omitting many occurrences uninteresting to the reader, was an unlucky year for my companion Wiley, the husband of Phoebe, whose taciturn and retiring nature has thus far kept him in the background. Notwithstanding Wiley seldom opened his mouth, and revolved in his obscure and unpretending orbit without a grumble, nevertheless the warm elements of sociality were strong in the bosom of that silent nigger. In the exuberance of his self-reliance, disregarding the philosophy of Uncle Abram, and setting the counsels of Aunt Phoebe utterly at naught, he had the foolhardiness to essay a nocturnal visit to a neighbouring cabin without a pass. So attractive was the society in which he found himself, that Wiley took little note of the passing hours, and the light began to break in the east before he was aware. Speeding homeward as fast as he could run, he hoped to reach the quarters before the horn would sound, but, unhappily, he was spied on the way by a company of patrollers. How it is in the other dark places of slavery, I do not know, but on Bayou Berth there is an organisation of patrollers, as they are styled, whose business it is to seize and whip any slave they may find wandering from the plantation. They ride on horseback, headed by a captain, armed and accompanied by dogs. They have the right, either by law or by general consent, to inflict discretionary chastisement upon a black man caught beyond the boundaries of his master's estate without a pass, and even to shoot him if he attempts to escape. Each company has a certain distance to ride up and down the bayou. They are compensated by the planters, who contribute in proportion to the number of slaves they own. The clatter of their horses' hoofs dashing by can be heard at all hours of the night, and frequently they may be seen driving a slave before them, or leading him by a rope fastened around his neck to his owner's plantation. Wiley fled before one of these companies, thinking he could reach his cabin before they could overtake him. But one of their dogs, a great ravenous hound, gripped him by the leg and held him fast. The patrollers whipped him severely and brought him, a prisoner, to Epps. From him he received another flagellation still more severe, so that the cuts of the lash and the bites of the dog rendered him sore, stiff and miserable, insomuch he was scarcely able to move. It was impossible in such a state to keep up his row, and consequently there was not an hour in the day but Wiley felt the sting of his master's rawhide on his raw and bleeding back. His sufferings became intolerable, and finally he resolved to run away. Without disclosing his intentions to run away, even to his wife Phoebe, he proceeded to make arrangements for carrying his plan into execution. Having cooked his whole week's allowance, he cautiously left the cabin on a Sunday night after the inmates of the quarters were asleep. When the horn sounded in the morning, Wiley did not make his appearance. Search was made for him in the cabins, in the corn crib, in the cotton house, and in every nook and corner of the premises. Each of us was examined, touching any knowledge we might have that could throw light upon his sudden disappearance or present whereabouts. Epps raved and stormed, and, mounting his horse, galloped to neighbouring plantations, making inquiries in all directions. The search was fruitless. Nothing whatever was elicited, going to show what had become of the missing man. The dogs were led to the swamp, but were unable to strike his trail. They would circle away through the forest, their noses to the ground, but invariably returned in a short time to the spot from whence they started. Wiley had escaped, and so secretly and cautiously as to elude and baffle all pursuit. Days and even weeks passed away, and nothing could be heard of him. Epps did nothing but curse and swear. It was the only topic of conversation among us when alone. We indulged in a great deal of speculation in regard to him, one suggesting he might have drowned in some bayou, inasmuch as he was a poor swimmer. Another, that perhaps he might have been devoured by alligators, or stung by the venomous moccasin, whose bite is certain and sudden death. The warm and hearty sympathies of us all, however, were with poor Wiley, wherever he might be. Many an earnest prayer ascended from the lips of Uncle Abram, beseeching safety for the wanderer. In about three weeks, when all hope of ever seeing him again was dismissed, to our surprise he one day appeared among us. On leaving the plantation, he informed us, it was his intention to make his way back to South Carolina, to the old quarters of Master Buford. During the day he remained secreted, sometimes in the branches of a tree, and at night pressed forward through the swamps. 
Finally, one morning, just at dawn, he reached the shore of Red River. While standing on the bank, considering how he could cross it, a white man accosted him and demanded a pass. Without one, and evidently a runaway, he was taken to Alexandria, the shire town of the parish of Rapides, and confined in prison. It happened, several days after that, Joseph B. Roberts, uncle of Mistress Epps, was in Alexandria, and, going into the jail, recognised him. Wiley had worked on his plantation, when Epps resided at Huff Power. Paying the jail fee, and writing him a pass, underneath which was a note to Epps requesting him not to whip him on his return, Wiley was sent back to Bayou Berth. It was the hope that hung upon this request, and which Roberts assured him would be respected by his master, that sustained him as he approached the house. The request, however, as may be readily supposed, was entirely disregarded. After being kept in suspense three days, Wiley was stripped and compelled to endure one of those inhuman floggings to which the poor slave is so often subjected. It was the first and last attempt of Wiley to run away. The long scars upon his back, which he will carry with him to the grave, perpetually remind him of the dangers of such a step. There was not a day throughout the ten years I belonged to Epps that I did not consult with myself upon the prospect of escape. I laid many plans, which at the time I considered excellent ones, but one after the other they were all abandoned. No man who has never been placed in such a situation can comprehend the thousand obstacles thrown in the way of the flying slave. Every white man's hand is raised against him, the patrollers are watching for him, the hounds are ready to follow on his track, and the nature of the country is such as renders it impossible to pass through it with any safety. I thought, however, that the time might come, perhaps, when I should be running through the swamps again. I concluded, in that case, to be prepared for Epps' dogs, should they pursue me. He possessed several, one of which was a notorious slave hunter, and the most fierce and savage of his breed. While out hunting the coon or the opossum, I never allowed an opportunity to escape, when alone, of whipping them severely. In this manner I succeeded at length in subduing them completely. They feared me, obeying my voice at once when others had no control over them whatever. Had they followed and overtaken me, I doubt not they would have shrank from attacking me. Notwithstanding the certainty of being captured, the woods and swamps are, nevertheless, continually filled with runaways. Many of them, when sick or so worn out as to be unable to perform their tasks, escape into the swamps, willing to suffer the punishment inflicted for such offences, in order to obtain a day or two of rest. When I belonged to Ford, I was unwittingly the means of disclosing the hiding place of six or eight, who had taken up their residence in the Great Pine Woods. Adam Tatum frequently sent me from the mills over to the opening after provisions. The whole distance was then a thick pine forest. About ten o'clock of a beautiful moonlight night, while walking along the Texas road, returning to the mills, carrying a dressed pig in a bag swung over my shoulder, I heard footsteps behind me, and, turning round, beheld two black men in the dress of slaves, approaching at a rapid pace. When within a short distance, one of them raised a club, as if intending to strike me, the other snatched at the bag. I managed to dodge them both, and, seizing a pine knot, hurled it with such force against the head of one of them that he was prostrated apparently senseless to the ground. Just then, two more made their appearance from one side of the road. Before they could grapple me, however, I succeeded in passing them, and, taking to my heels, fled, much affrighted, towards the mills. When Adam was informed of the adventure, he hastened straight away to the Indian village, and, arousing Cascala and several of his tribe, started in pursuit of the highwaymen. I accompanied them to the scene of attack, when we discovered a puddle of blood in the road, where the man whom I had smitten with the pine knot had fallen. After searching carefully through the woods a long time, one of Cascala's men discovered a smoke curling up through the branches of several prostrate pines, whose tops had fallen together. The rendezvous was cautiously surrounded, and all of them taken prisoners. They had escaped from a plantation in the vicinity of La Morie, and had been secreted there three weeks. They had no evil design upon me, except to frighten me out of my pig. Having observed me passing towards Fords just at nightfall, and suspecting the nature of my errand, they had followed me, seen me butcher and dress the porker, and start on my return. They had been pinched for food, and were driven to this extremity by necessity. 
Adam conveyed them to the parish jail, and was liberally rewarded. Not unfrequently the runaway loses his life in the attempt to escape. Epps' premises were bounded on one side by Carey's, a very extensive sugar plantation. He cultivates annually at least 1,500 acres of cane, manufacturing 22 or 2,300 hogsheads of sugar, and hogshead and a half being the usual yield of an acre. Besides this, he also cultivates five or six hundred acres of corn and cotton. He owned last year 153 field hands, besides nearly as many children, and yearly hires a drove during the busy season from this side the Mississippi. One of his Negro drivers, a pleasant, intelligent boy, was named Augustus. During the holidays, and occasionally while at work in adjoining fields, I had an opportunity of making his acquaintance, which eventually ripened into a warm and mutual attachment. Summer before last, he was so unfortunate as to incur the displeasure of the overseer, a coarse, heartless brute who whipped him most cruelly. Augustus ran away. Reaching a cane rick on Hawkins' plantation, he secreted himself in the top of it. All Carey's dogs were put upon his track, some fifteen of them, and soon scented his footsteps to the hiding place. They surrounded the rick, baying and scratching, but could not reach him. Presently, guided by the clamour of the hounds, the pursuers rode up, when the overseer, mounting on to the rick, drew him forth. As he rolled down to the ground, the whole pack plunged upon him, and, before they could be beaten off, had gnawed and mutilated his body in the most shocking manner, their teeth having penetrated to the bone in an hundred places. He was taken up, tied upon a mule, and carried home. But this was Augustus' last trouble. He lingered until the next day, when death sought the unhappy boy, and kindly relieved him from his agony. It was not unusual for slave women as well as slave men to endeavour to escape. Nelly, Eldred's girl, with whom I lumbered for a time in the big cane brake, lay concealed in Epp's corn crib three days. At night, when his family were asleep, she would steal into the quarters for food, and return to the crib again. We concluded it would no longer be safe for us to allow her to remain, and accordingly she retraced her steps to her own cabin. But the most remarkable instance of a successful evasion of dogs and hunters was the following. Among Carey's girls was one by the name of Celeste. She was nineteen or twenty, and far whiter than her owner or any of his offspring. It required a close inspection to distinguish in her features the slightest trace of African blood. A stranger would never have dreamed that she was the descendant of slaves. I was sitting in my cabin late at night, playing a low air on my violin, when the door opened carefully and Celeste stood before me. She was pale and haggard. Had an apparition arisen from the earth, I could not have been more startled. "'Who are you?' I demanded, after gazing at her a moment. "'I'm hungry. Give me some bacon,' was her reply." My first impression was that she was some deranged young mistress, who, escaping from home, was wandering, she knew not whither, and had been attracted to my cabin by the sound of the violin. The coarse cotton slave dress she wore, however, soon dispelled such a supposition. "'What is your name?' I again interrogated. "'My name is Celeste,' she answered. "'I belong to Carey, and have been two days among the palmettos. I'm sick and can't work, and would rather die in the swamp than be whipped to death by the overseer.' Carey's dogs won't follow me. They've tried to set them on. There's a secret between them and Celeste, and they won't mind the devilish orders of the overseer. Give me some meat. I'm starving. I divided my scanty allowance with her, and while partaking of it, she related how she had managed to escape, and described the place of her concealment. In the edge of the swamp, not half a mile from Epp's house, was a large space, thousands of acres in extent, thickly covered with palmetto. Tall trees, whose long arms interlocked each other, formed a canopy above them, so dense as to exclude the beams of the sun. It was like twilight always, even in the middle of the brightest day. In the centre of this great space, which nothing but serpents very often explore, a sombre and solitary spot, Celeste had erected a rude hut of dead branches that had fallen to the ground, and covered it with the leaves of the palmetto. This was the abode she had selected. She had no fear of Carey's dogs any more than I had of Epps. It is a fact, which I have never been able to explain, that there are those whose tracks the hounds will absolutely refuse to follow. Celeste was one of them. For several nights she came to my cabin for food. 
on one occasion our dogs barked as she approached which aroused epps and induced him to reconnoitre the premises he did not discover her but after that it was not deemed prudent for her to come to the yard while all was silent i carried provisions to a certain spot agreed upon where she would find them in this manner celeste passed the greater part of the summer she regained her health and became strong and hearty at all seasons of the year the howlings of wild animals can be heard at night along the borders of the swamps several times they had made her a midnight call awakening her from slumber with a growl terrified by such unpleasant salutations she finally concluded to abandon her lonely dwelling and accordingly returning to her master was scourged her neck meanwhile being fastened in the stocks and sent into the field again the year before my arrival in the country there was a concerted movement among a number of slaves on bayou boeuf that terminated tragically indeed it was i presume a matter of newspaper notoriety at the time but all the knowledge i have of it has been derived from the relation of those living at that period in the immediate vicinity of the excitement it has become a subject of general and unfailing interest in every slave hut on the bayou and will doubtless go down to succeeding generations as their chief tradition lou cheney with whom i became acquainted a shrewd cunning negro more intelligent than the generality of his race but unscrupulous and full of treachery conceived the project of organising a company sufficiently strong to fight their way against all opposition to the neighbouring territory of mexico a remote spot far within the depths of the swamp back of hawkins plantation was selected as the rallying point lou flitted from one plantation to another in the dead of night preaching a crusade to mexico and like peter the hermit creating a furore of excitement wherever he appeared at length a large number of runaways were assembled stolen mules and corn gathered from the fields and bacon filched from smoke-houses had been conveyed into the woods the expedition was about ready to proceed when their hiding-place was discovered lou cheney becoming convinced of the ultimate failure of his project in order to curry favour with his master and avoid the consequences which he foresaw would follow deliberately determined to sacrifice all his companions departing secretly from the encampment he proclaimed among the planters the number collected in the swamp and instead of stating truly the object they had in view asserted their intention was to emerge from their seclusion the first favourable opportunity and murder every white person along the bayou such an announcement exaggerated as it passed from mouth to mouth filled the whole country with terror the fugitives were surrounded and taken prisoners carried in chains to alexandria and hung by the populace not only those but many who were suspected though entirely innocent were taken from the field and from the cabin and without the shadow of process or form of trial hurried to the scaffold the planters on bayou boeuf finally rebelled against such reckless destruction of property but it was not until a regiment of soldiers had arrived from some fort on the texan frontier demolished the gallows and opened the doors of the alexandria prison that the indiscriminate slaughter was stayed lou cheney escaped and was even rewarded for his treachery he is still living but his name is despised and execrated by all his race throughout the parishes of rapides and avoyel such an idea as insurrection however is not new among the enslaved population of bayou boeuf more than once i have joined in serious consultation when the subject has been discussed and there have been times when a word from me would have placed hundreds of my fellow bondsmen in an attitude of defiance without arms or ammunition or even with them i saw such a step would result in certain defeat disaster and death and always raised my voice against it during the mexican war i well remember the extravagant hopes that were excited the news of victory filled the great house with rejoicing but produced only sorrow and disappointment in the cabin in my opinion and i have had opportunity to know something of the feeling of which i speak there are not fifty slaves on the shores of bayou boeuf but would hail with unmeasured delight the approach of an invading army they are deceived who flatter themselves that the ignorant and debased slave has no conception of the magnitude of his wrongs they are deceived who imagine that he arises from his knees with back lacerated and bleeding cherishing only a spirit of meekness and forgiveness a day may come it will come if his prayer is heard a terrible day of vengeance 
when the master in his turn will cry in vain for mercy. End of chapter 17